I just uh, show this picture of the Earth um, as seen by the astron you know the, uh, the the astronauts from Moon. I like this picture because uh, it looks like it's it's after we left the Earth that we actually uh, start understanding more about the Earth. If you look at the images of the aerosol, if you look at all those global images which are now being produced by the NASA, we know much more about the the exterior surface of the Earth as we look from from the atmosphere. Uh, but the interior of the Earth also has a lot of mysteries about it. Uh, uh, you know, like, uh, Earth is one of the most unique planets in the solar system because, as we know today, it's the only planet that supports life. It is the only planet that has got a dynamic uh, climate, uh, topography, uh, and other activities because of the internal uh, dynamics of the Earth, you have got earthquakes, you have got volcanoes, and things like that. Why is it that Earth is the only planet with all of these features? It, you have to go back to the evolution of the Earth itself. I'll spend only two minutes or three minutes on uh, that internal structure, and then I'll go, go into uh, one of the most important consequences of that internal activity, which is the earthquakes. So my specialization is mostly looking at earthquakes. So why, why does the Earth have an internal structure uh, so different from the other planets? For any planet to, uh, uh, to have a sustainable life, life system, it should have a proper size, it should be at the right distance from the sun, and it should have a constant path of rotation around the, uh, around the sun. Earth, fortunately, uh, has all of these ingredients. And Earth also had the, the you know, it, it, throughout its evolutionary course, it could uh, cool very gradually, and it could develop a highly uh, stratified uh, a layered system in which you, uh, originally it was a gravitational uh, cooling, and there was a thermal differentiation. Uh, lighter material started rising up. Denser material started going in, 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 inward, and they formed the core. And this also is sustained by the radioactive heat. So therefore, we have a core which is almost like the heart of the Earth. If there is no core, there is no life for the planet Earth. It is the core and its heat. The heat that it releases from the core, which becomes mantle convection cells. Uh, perhaps uh, Atrigo talked about it. It is almost like it's the, the, you know, the nervous system and the veins through which the blood pass in our body. So it is the heat engine that's supported by the Earth that gives its life. And that heat is what it gives its most essential uh, fields, like the, mag the magnetic field of the Earth and the, the plate tectonics, which is the life-sustaining um, dynamic effect of the, of the Earth. So if you look at the thermal evolution, Throughout, so the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. We don't know much about its early history, as slowly it started evolving. And today we know that it has stratified and the temperature has become stable. So the present temperature, we can actually see, because of the different layers which we infer from seismology, I'll just give you a brief uh, view of that. We have different layers, which is the, you know, the top is about 100 kilometers below the lithosphere. Below that, you have the mantle. And there is a very, very interesting layer out here, which is called the D double prime layer, where there is a huge, a very significant phase transition. It is believed that this layer is very, very influential in developing the mantle uh, plumes. And the mantle plumes, in turn, also is very, respons very much responsible for the driving the plates and keeping the plate dynamo, the plate uh, tectonic system alive. Uh, below that, there is a fluid core and there is an inner solid core. The presence of this inner core and the outer fluid core and the thermal uh, agitations that happen within that uh, is actually responsible for the magnetic field of the Earth. So, uh, what is the, uh, the past and future? How many years are we talking about? Uh, shift in the graph? Yeah, this actually must be a few uh, millions, millions of years, yeah. Because that is basically the diffusion. You know, you have so much of uh, radioactivity. And this, uh, like, you can use different models of, you know, what is going to be the decay. But uh, what's important here is that you are, uh, you are at about, see, actually, some people ask, what is the life of the magnetic field of the Earth? 
How long are we going to have this magnetic field? It depends upon this thermal, uh, thermal state. So you, uh, how do we probe the Earth? We probe the Earth using the seismic waves. We probe the Earth using the seismic waves. Uh, when we have earthquakes, the earthquakes actually is a typical uh, earthquake recorded uh, on, a, on, a, on a what you call a seismograph. And you have various waves picked up at various times. This is time and this is the amplitude, displacement or a velocity. So you can actually, what actually happens, this is, you can imagine this is the source of the earthquake. It releases energy, elastic energy, it travels as waves and it reaches different places. And you can assume a model, which, which you can call a primary reference Earth model. And you can use the velocities based on all your uh, you know, knowledge about the Earth. And then you can, uh, you can predict, OK, what is going to happen at each of these locations. And based on these kind of uh, arrivals, we are able to find out what is the depth to each of these interfaces. That is how, how actually we map the Earth. And the present concept is that you have several layers. These are uh, chemically or uh, thermally, uh, or you know, even uh, uh, because of certain phase transitions, they will show uh, impedance contrast. They will show a velocity change, which will be reflected in all in such uh, wave wave paths. Interestingly, there is one layer called the D double prime. I said this is a layer between the this is a layer above the the, the outer core which is supposed to be the source for uh, slow transmission of heat from the core and it develops uh, you know undulations because of melting and they become a, they give rise to decompression melting magma start rising magma find its own vents and they reach uh, some of these places where you find uh, a vent through which the magma comes out and uh, you can have the plate tectonic mechanism now in, if you do not have all this you don't get that kind of a heat heat transmission from the core. So this is again a velocity image that you can calculate from this kind of arrivals of global. It's an, it's an area of global seismology where you can use stations all around the globe and pick up uh, times and then do an inversion and find out where are these discontinuities, what depth it happens. That's an area of uh, seismology that keep on refining our models of uh, our uh, you know Im images of the Earth. The most important outcome, I said, one of the most important outcome is the, the magnetic field. Because you have this thermal, uh, thermal uh, layers, you have all these uh, currents which are going from here. In the, and due to the rotation, it almost picks, it, pick, it becomes like a dynamo. It generates its own magnetic field, and uh, you sustain the magnetic field. We won't talk about that. We will concentrate more on the other outcome, that is, I said, we have uh, material that is coming up through the wherever there are weak zones. Uh, it will come out and it will open up oceans. It will uh, create what you call mid-oceanic ridge systems. So here is these are all your plate boundaries defined by the two different plates. It could be a place where the plates are diverging because materials are coming, or it could be a place where the plates are converging, like you have the Indian plate. This side, so I'll, we'll come to that. So here you have uh, several plate boundaries. So in uh, in summary, we have the top 100 kilometers of the Earth. It's called the lithosphere. is divided into various plates, and they move. They 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 move in specific speeds, and because of that, they eventually they, you don't have any loss or gain of matter. They will get circulated. They will get subducted wherever they cannot find a pathway. They get subducted and they come back again, so it gets recycled. So you keep on, the, essentially the size of the Earth is uh, the same, and you know, this keeps happening. Every 200 million years, they say one cycle is completed, and you keep uh, finding newer uh, geometries. Now, now with the GPS, we know very precisely how the plates are moving. So uh, this is a very... So are we okay with this so far? So that's the, the basic uh, uh, you know, thing that happens in plate motions. Now let us zoom into what is happening in India. India broke away from Madagascar about uh, 120 million years back. One would ask me, how do we know these things? One of the important things is actually, uh, anytime there is a, a magmatic eruption, anytime there is a basaltic flow outside, it is actually a molten stage about 1,000 degrees centigrade, maybe it's anyway about 600 
that is a query point, and as it solidifies, it will assume the magnetic field that is present at that time. So based on that paleomagnetic field, you can reconstruct the position of the continent because you will find the pole of that magnetic field, which is assumed to be similar to the geographic pole, and then you can construct the... So here we actually used the basalt eruption in 60 million years ago. We have this, uh, you know, you know the Deccan basalt in, in, in Bombay and all, you'll find all that basaltic layer. So India started moving about 70 million years ago. It was here. You can see it was further south of equator. It started moving and around 40 million years ago, India collided with the Eurasia and the Himalaya formed. So here is your major continent and continent colliding together to form a huge mountain chain. And today, because of the, con because the collision has become slow, the 50 centime 5 centimeter uh, uh, speed has now reduced to about 2 centimeters. So India is converging at about 20 millimeters across this plate boundary, what you call a plate boundary between the Indian plate and the Eurasian plate. So this is a continent-continent convergence zone, which is seismically very productive because you have a lot of stresses accumulating along these plate boundaries and the push from this continental movement continues and as the, the stresses get accumulated, they get released in the form of great earthquakes. So you have uh, several great earthquakes along the, large earthquakes along the plate boundary, large meaning magnitude more than seven. You also have uh, more than eight, four, eight earthquakes have occurred here. Four earthquakes of magnitude eight have occurred here. Recently, there has been uh, a big news that a great earthquake is shaping up somewhere here. I'll come to that. Uh, so uh, so that this is the plate boundary where a lot of things happen. And we'll also talk about what happened in 2004 in the Andaman Sumatra subduction zone. Unlike the continent, here is an oceanic subduction. An ocean plate is subducting beneath a continental plate. Here you'll also, earthquakes will also generate great tsunamis. So this is the, the tectonic setting in which earthquakes happen. So you can use, now you can use uh, GPS-based vectors to calculate the convergence. So like you have a GPS station in IASC, so that is supposed to be like, you know, you just know it's away from all the action. You can use that one GPS station with another GPS station, say in say Tibet, and see what is a, a change in the position with one year. So in one year, if you keep repeat measurements, you will see that the distance between these stations are reduced by two centimeters. So that is what the convergence rate. So uh, so this is the uh, the way the plates are moving. And because of that, globally, you will find uh, earthquakes are now almost coincident with the plate boundaries. These are the divergent boundaries where, you know, I said the magma comes out. They are very, very narrow. And whereas the, these are the convergent boundaries where you will find highly diffused zones of activity. It's almost like, uh, uh, you know, like you have a night light, but these are very, very, um, technologically advanced uh, production by the National Geophysical Data Center. We, they have actually used the scaling of the energy released by great earthquakes to size up the density of these, uh, intensity of these, uh, these uh, spots. So this is the image of the, the Earth and an undesirable consequence of plate motion. If there were no plate motion, we will not have mountains, we will not have the topography, we will, we will not have the climatic stability, we will not have the rich soils to cultivate. Without plate tectonics, you cannot live here. But we also have to live with the undesirable consequences such as the volcanoes and, uh, and the earthquakes, which has been shaping the earth, so we can't complain about them. Uh, so this is the picture as you see today. The, the, the seismicity, and I'm going to take you to uh, some specific earthquakes here, and I'm going to just uh, talk to you more about what are the problems and challenges that we, we encounter as we try to understand, uh, you know, the, everybody knows you cannot predict earthquakes. So the, effect is, the, the effort today is, what is the earthquake going to do to you? The earthquake is going to happen someday, we know that, but what is the effect of that earthquake? That's all we can pretty much at least try and predict. So that's, that's what I'll just, uh, uh, you know, talk about. So we look at it, uh, we look at some specific examples of earthquakes, which is, you know, we see what we do, we, we have these earthquakes and we have these records. We have to use our knowledge of the material properties. We have to use our tools in mathematics and physics to understand what happened at the source. The source may be five kilometers, it could be 50 kilometers, it could be 200 kilometers or even 600 kilometers. So we have to, we, all we have is the records 
made by the seismic stations all around the globe, which is going to uh, measure the displacement of the, you know, the particle at that particular station as the way it has happened at the source. So we will, you, we have, all we have is to play around with these records and try to understand what happened at the source. So we will use some examples of recent earthquakes, which will tell us more about the mechanisms of the earthquakes and the source processes and how they generate the tsunami. We'll also talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how these are actually, uh, you know, used, how are they, the, how they, how we use the displacement records to assume the source. And we'll just talk about how the outcome of the source models will tell us about the magnitude, depth, and the rupture. See, an earthquake can originate here. It can go that side. It can go this side. It can also go both ways. So it can be a unilateral rupture. It can be a bilateral rupture. It can also stop at some place. It can again pick up. What controls this? One has to imagine that all this is happening on about 20 kilometer slab. And you're talking about a three-dimensional rupture. And the properties, we are not aware of the property. We have no idea what is below. So we will, uh, and also, uh, we will also talk a little bit about the tsunami modeling and, you know, how do we actually, uh, re how do we understand this uh, tsunami uh, process? So uh, I want to just give you some uh, basics of what we actually do. So what, uh, like I told you, we, uh, I showed you the seismogram. So basically, you have an earthquake somewhere here. You have global stations, any number of stations you can pick up, which will be available to you freely. And we get that data. And then what is that? That's actually the displacement as recorded by certain stations. Now we can assume certain physical parameters. We can give properties. We can develop our own seismogram, which is called a synthetic model. And you can actually uh, match the synthetic model with the observed model, observed seismogram, till you are able to match several of them. Maybe hundreds of those seismograms have to be matched. And then you produce that source, which will give you the magnitude, slip, and the rupture velocity, everything, that will match with the, all of these seismograms. So anytime we have an earthquake, we can download this data, process the data, generate the, seismo the seismograms in the format we want, and then run our own uh, displacement codes and try to match it until you find a good match. So uh, this is how you actually do a seismogram way for modeling. Like you can get, these are the observed and the, the computed. So wherever, where, you know, you have to try your best to produce so many of these uh, complete waveform matches. Everything is not going to match. So for a 10 second duration, 10 minute duration, you can actually match it. And then you can come up with that source parameters, which has given you this match. So that's your source model. That source model will tell you uh, how you have your source has slipped, et cetera. Now with this background, I'm going to take you through uh, three, four uh, regions, which are very important for, from the Indian context. One, part, one is actually the boundary between the Arabian plate and the Eurasian plate. We are here, this is the Indian plate. This is, this is what another subduction zone where this is an oceanic plate subducting beneath a continental plate. This region actually is called the Makran subduction zone. It is very important from our point of view because uh, it generated a tsunami in 1945. Nobody actually knew about it. In fact, we never thought about tsunamis until 2004 because we thought that's only something that Japan has to worry about. So when 2004 tsunami occurred, some of us had to uh, study this in detail. And then we found out actually there was something here which of course we knew, but it had even killed people in Bombay. So there is a sudden wake up call for uh, atomic power plants because 2004 tsunami, uh, it affected, almost affected the, Kudum, the you know, the, the, the Kalpakam plant, the water had almost come up very close to its, uh, you know, its uh, critical, uh, you know, the parameters. So uh, then suddenly we started looking at, okay, what, what will happen if you have an earthquake somewhere here? What will happen to Gujarat or what will happen to Bombay? So this is, the, this is why we start looking at all this. So we, we start studying. So to understand that, first of all, you need to understand what is the source model, whether the movement is a translation or there is a vertical component for the motion. If there is a translatory movement, there is very little possibility that an earthquake will happen. If there is a vertical component of the motion, it depends on the stress field you are in. If you have a vertical component, immediately there's a displacement of water column and there is a transmission of tsunami. So this is why we actually try to understand what's the source model 
That is why if you if we have an earthquake, immediately the tsunami warning center will download, look at the source model. Okay, if there is a vertical component, they are immediately ready to give a warning because vertical component is what disturbs the, the water column on the ocean floor. So this is one of those uh, uh, earthquakes that uh, you know that has generated a tsunami, which which came all the way to Bombay, uh, Karachi, and Gujarat. It was almost uh, 10, 8 to 10 meter high in the Gulf of Kutch. This is a model that predicts. And you can imagine now, in all this Gulf of Kutch, you have a lot of uh, port and so much of activities. If you can have another re replay of this kind of a thing, it could be extremely devastating. So that is why we need to understand what is the source here, what is it doing. So we pick up, uh, so I just wanted to show you, this is how that old story of Times of India, 1945, November 28, the tsunami ended this uh, small creek and the waves got amplified and people died here. So after 2004, we dug up all this literature. Uh, we were looking for what has happened in 2004, uh, to the, in 1945, and we found all, all of these kind of uh, information. So this is a very, uh, very interesting place. What actually happened here is again very, very interesting that there, once you do the source model you will, and you do the wave propagation model using simple shallow water equations, you will find that there's a huge mismatch between the expected time and the arrival time. So it is like almost like a several minutes delay between even the nearby station and the, uh, and the source of the tsunami. Then is that, that is when people started looking for alternate models, saying that it is not actually the displacement of the ocean floor, it is a mudslide, it is a landslide. So what is happening here is this is a huge uh, sediment uh, wedge. This wedge is formed when the Eurasian plate is converging with the, uh, the Arabian plate. There's a lot of discharge of sediments from the Himalayan river systems. You find a lot of sediments here and you start pushing them together. They almost become like a, they curl up and become like a, like a wedge. It is like you put a, you know, a top layer of icing on a cake and you just skews it. The cake has got a different, uh, uh, structure so it will deform slightly less while the icing will sort of skews up and sort of it will become stacked up in this form. Now I will I'll come back to this in, in the, the Burmese example so we just need to realize here that the different properties so here you have a, a, a continental a oceanic crust which is denser here you have a sediment which is lesser less density and here you have all these sediments which again are less. So if you, if you consider a 100 kilometer thick plate that is being pushed, are these all going to deform in the same way? Is this going to move just like that? Is it going to strip seismically? Can it creep? All of these issues will start coming up. Any case, if you have an earthquake, there can be a component of motion which is translated here. There can be simple ground shaking and the wedge can fall into the ocean. Just because of that, a tsunami can happen. So that is actually what happens here. That is why there is a delay. It's still like coming after two hours. Slowly, it will, you know, it will, it will affect you. So this is the uh, the Makran subduction zone, where the critical issue is whether the wedge is actually going to deform. So the geophysical problem here is, what is that material property, and how is the shaking from all these places are going to affect this? So recently, there was a very interesting example. Uh, where an earthquake was 200 kilometers inland, and it still created a tsunami. 200 kilometers inland is the first time there is such an earthquake, 200 kilometers inland, there is no possibility of uh, displacement on the ocean floor, but still there was a tsunami, small one. What actually it does is, it has gone and uh, pushed this wedge, possibly, and then it, it has got a small, it has also a small component or vertical component that pushes this, and that probably creates a tsunami. So if we, we do all these uh, source models to find out, this is our way of expressing what is the, the type of motion. So this is, a, this is more or less a translatory motion with a small oblique component. And now we will try to find out where exactly is that oblique component, and then try to model it. And this also is like the slip, the, how the slip has taken place along the entire rupture area, say 200 kilometer, and the depth is, say, 30 kilometer. Within that whole rupture volume, where is the slip? So that is very important for us. If the slip decides to happen here, you are done. Then you have a tsunami. So if the slip is mostly here, you are safer. So we have to understand the behavior of this fault in terms of how it is going to rupture and how the slip is going to get distributed. So that's our, that's our models. And then we, we can, but then where we get stuck is 
the material property. How do we how do we actually model the transfer of slip from one material to the other? Is it can you treat it as a continuum? Can you divide them into discrete levels and then how do you transfer the stress? That becomes a challenge for us. Uh, now we move into the Himalaya. Himalaya, I told you, this is the plate boundary, the Himalayan plate boundary, which is the boundary between the Indian and the Eurasian plates. Very interestingly, there are lots of earthquakes, like this is this occurred in Kashmir, this is in Garhwal, west of Garhwal, this is Kangra, a place called Kangra. These are all in Garhwal, Himalaya. These are all, all three are in Garhwal. This is Bihar, border of Bihar, Nepal. This is Nepal. This is Shillong, and this is Assam. Now, these, all these red ones are above eight. You can see between 1897, 1934, 1950, and this is uh, 1905. This is actually very close to eight. Four earthquakes have occurred here, and these are all less than eight. What is happening here? There is no earthquake here. Now they say, now the convergence is the same. Like you can have, this is 13 uh, millimeter, 18 millimeter, 20, 19, 17. So the convergence seems to be the same. But so what happened here? So it is, it is believed that there is a segment, unbroken segment between these two earthquakes, which is ready to break any time. This is why there's always a news that Himalaya is going to have a great earthquake anytime, because this is an unbroken central segment where an earthquake is imminent anytime, based on the slip models. So when the, 19, uh, when the 2015 Nepal earthquake occurred, people thought that this is the one that people were expecting. But its magnitude was not eight, nor was it in this, this region. It was here at the edge of this thing. That is why we believe that the, the threat is still there. The warning is not withdrawn. It can still happen because there's a huge gap. This is called the central segment. I want to just impress upon uh, one very, very important aspect about the, 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 the Himalayan earthquakes. They told you this is the Indian plate, this is a Eurasian plate. This is going down, this is climbing up, giving rise to the Himalaya, Everest, and everything. There is a contact plane between the two, which is called the detachment plane. It is believed that the earthquakes originate on the detachment plane, which is about 10, 20 kilometers, and it propagates all the way to the south. It will almost reach, reach sometimes can reach the, you know, the, these plains, all these plains nearby. Uh, so it will affect, mostly affect this region, the Indo-Gangetic plains. So the great earthquakes in the past, like 1934, have seriously affected the Indo-Gangetic plains. And Indo-Gangetic plains have very thick alluvial sediments, which will amplify the energy, so the damage is expected to be very high. Because you have, uh, first of all, you have a lot of settlements here, and you also have these alluvial deposits, which will amplify your seismic energy. So this is the mechanism we always understood based on the historic data, because the historic data only tells you about the damage. Say this uh, temple got damaged, Kutab Minar got damaged, all these other issues. We don't have a seismic record. The only time we had a seismic record of a good earthquake, uh, of a large earthquake is 2015. And then, so for all these, we don't have any source models or anything. So we believe that the earthquake originate on the detachment plane, it just propagates all the way up here, and we are affected because we live here. However, when the Nepal earthquake occurred, we have the opportunity now to look at the seismic records and evolve its models. So what did it do? It decided to go in a different way. It occurred here, and then it propagated to the west, to the east. It did not come south. It just went this way. Not only that, after about 15 days, it triggered another earthquake here, almost comparable magnitude. The two earthquakes in a row, and all happening in this direction. But today, we also have a lot of uh, good data, like satellite sensing. So we can improve our models by using images like INSAR. What you see here, this slightly reddish patch is the uplifted part, and this purplish part is the downtone. So this is the image you can just process. You can use it along with the seismological data. And so here is your detachment plane. So it, it, it's supposed to come up like this, but it did not come up. So there was no damage at all in the Indian plains. So these kind of things we can understand from the model. But when we do the model, again, there is a problem. See, this is one earthquake, which, see, this is actually the way the moment is released. You can see it is a single pulse of moment. 
simple rupture and these are the slips for covering a large area whereas the second one you can see the rupture is very small highly localized and it releases in small small pulses of energy so the source properties are different why are the source properties different it is probably because the materials are different there are material heterogeneities the way the stresses are transferred it also tells us that based on the nature of this asperity may based on the material here you can also have a larger earthquake who says that it should be only 7.3 it can be 8 so the lessons we learn from here we always thought okay an earthquake occurs after shocks are just going to follow they're going to be smaller and you can go home you can just do your studies and you know do after shock survey see your relief and you are done no it can again trigger another earthquake because we know so little about this sources so the source models tell us a lot more about what happens and how we need to understand them in greater detail and how our inferences just based on the surface observations can be very very uh, insufficient to suggest what could happen so we do all these other things like we project the aftershocks and we con we make uh, convince ourselves that the surface rupture never reached here this is the rupture mft this is actually very close to deradun or you know you know if you look, go lat uh, longitude wise deradun will be just very close to the mft that's a, where the earthquake actually finally supposed to terminate but did not come up the slip did not come up and we we never felt uh, any of such uh, such shaking effects in in up in parts of up very very little actually now i'm going to take you to the indo gangetic the the burmese arc where there is a recent paper locking and loading of mega thrust linked to active subduction beneath indo burma ranges the hindu had picked it up uh, as a big news it's all over the place major earthquake lurking under india bangladesh study so according to them now look at this picture this is a plate boundary this is the whole thing is a plate boundary here you had the 1934 earthquake between the india eurasia here we had the 1950 earthquake another great earthquake here we had the 1897 shillong another great earthquake this is a historically known earthquake 1762 and this is the 2004 great tsunami genic earthquake that broke about 1300 kilometers long plate boundary it was 1300 kilometers long and these are smaller ruptures below so this is the earthquake originated somewhere here it's it 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 unzips this entire locked plate boundary and now you know that nothing is going to happen here for some time till the stresses build up again which is believed to be about 500 years that you 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 again build up the stress okay let us come back here so the belief is that your great earthquake is going to happen here how did they know this they use uh, so here is just to show you that this is the background seismicity Uh, which shows that there is no great earthquakes here. Uh, this is just a magnitude 6.7, which happened uh, last this year, early this year. Oh, they have done a GPS uh, model, GPS study, and they say that the GPS uh, stress is suggesting a 19 uh, 19 millimeter movement across the Indian plate and the Burmese plate. So therefore, their model, assuming that this plate boundary is unlocked, is locked. they come up and say that okay this is going to be the great earthquake but here is where we have a lot of problems because this is basically a model the model makes a lot of assumptions which may or may not be true so what actually we what we look at see this is their model they say okay here is again that same wedge will come here here is the indian plate which is subducting and this is the the burmese plate which is here now look at the properties so this is the continental plate and this becomes an oceanic plate under the ocean these are all sediments this is again a wedge just because you have a lot of sediments coming in again the brahmaputra river sediments all of them get skewed up here time oh, okay so all of them get skewed up here and they they become like a wedge so this is uh, again the the model is whether whether the the wedge actually is locked or is it unlocked so the gps model assumes that it is locked but is it really locked or is it a seismic we have we don't have any evidence for that seismological data however uh, says that the, the 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 you know the convergence is only in this direction this is the arrow there is nothing like this and there are all the earthquakes are occurring within the plate itself there is no scope for uh, any uh, plate boundary earthquakes let's take another 5 minutes or i'll stop here okay maybe
So uh, next part is just the Andaman part. I'll be done in two minutes. So in the Andaman part, what is happening is the ocean plate subducts beneath the, the continental plate. And these are the huge earthquakes, the ruptures from the huge earthquake. What we have done here, it's a very challenging problem for us. What we have done here is we have actually used the, uh, the satellite uh, data that was just passing through the ocean to reconstruct the, the solution. So what we do is we need all these source parameters. We are going uh, through some uh, the you know, geophysical data, go back to a, a model problem, and then come back and see what has actually happened. So what we do here is we use the displacements uh, picked up from the, like I told you, we pick up the displacement from the source model. We pick up all these displacements. Now we use a, a simple uh, shallow water equations actually to propagate the tsunami for all, all these grids and then try to reconstruct what is happening. Now we use the, the satellite data. This is the satellite was going through here. We don't want to use this because it will amplify the energy here. So we use the satellite data, try to do a forward problem, and try to ma match the waveform, and then use that waveform to go back and find out the source. That's our inverse problem. Through that inverse problem, we, we are able to find the source parameters like the magnitude. That's about 9.3. Uh, these are all actually uh, several iterations where the iteration stabilizes, that's the value we take. Then we also find the seismic moment, that's the measure of energy released. Again, uh, three, three, three values which for you know, different, different uh, combinations. Then we also find the slip with all its errors. The importance of this problem is basically, and also the velocity with which the rupture occurred. The importance of this problem is, uh, you know, this kind of large optimization problems where you use a large data points and use these uh, uh, codes. We also learn how to propagate the errors. What is the error doing here? When do you stabilize it? This is actually not, uh, I do this in collaboration with Professor Debashi Roy in civil engineering. So I just want to summarize that the geophysical environment is, uh, you know, poses several modeling challenges which requires knowledge of the region. Uh, you also need, uh, we need to explain whether the geodetic models can actually explain locked and unlocked uh, sections. And the tsunami model, again, it's a very, just a new work that we are doing. It can actually help uh, generate the inversion codes for tsunami warning systems, et cetera. But this is, again, a you know, very intense model problems which mostly mathematicians can actually tackle. So I want to thank uh, Revadi, my PhD student, who is working mostly on the source models and Devaraj, who's working on the, the tsunami propagation models, is a work with <coughs> Professor Devashish Roy in, in civil engineering. Thank you so much. Quick question. Yeah. Sanjay, you yes. don't need the <laughs> yeah. I mean, one reads often about these precursors to earthquakes. Uh, what is the sort of current status uh, about that? And I mean, what kind of warning can one get? that an earthquake is incipient or something, huh? Actually, uh, there are, um, you know, the, the, the physics of that is actually just before a great earthquake, there can be some preparations. Yeah. So people used to think that before a great uh, rupture is happening in our source volume, it is not going to be like a, just a one rupture. It might have small cracks before the... Uh, See, there's actually many physics models where they yeah, try yes, statistical yes, physics yes, to model. They do, yeah. I was just wondering whether there's some quantitative... It, it actually well. varies from one place to the other. Because sometimes you, can, you may not have any signal at all. Mm. Uh, in, 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 in earthquakes like the 2004 tsunami earthquake, you do get precursors. But we actually did not, did not recognize them. In fact, there is a compression going on before the earthquake, and it was going on for almost one or two years. Mm. So we were actually walking through this port player, trying to do some GPS work. We saw these corals uplifted almost 10 centimeters above the surface. Uh. All through the islands, we saw that. We threw <laughs> photographs, very happy, but it was actually the precursor. It actually makes a lot of sense. Mm. So after the earthquake, it went down, because it got pulled down. So these are the kind of things you learn once in your lifetime. So maybe the next generation might gain from this. I should say the statistical physics guys are good at predicting the earthquake after it has happened. Yes. And also the stock market crash, yes, crash after yes, this yes. happened. I mean, so this is, is a, but you know, I think uh, <laughs> you know, all over the world, people have actually given up predicting the earthquake. They are only trying to predict the effect. Effect. And here, issue a warning, like use the uh, transmission time of uh, S-wave, delay of surface waves, and give an alert. Mm. Like, a, you know, like alert to an automatic uh, train or something, they give an alert. Mm. In, in the Mexican coast, they do this. So the earthquake occurs in the sea, and it's 400 kilometers away. The effect is going to come to the land. 
So they can give a, a, you know, that the wave transmission speeds they can use and give an automatic alert. And this is connected to telephone systems and, you know, mobile phones and all that. So they get like a 30 seconds, 50 seconds warning, like that. That is all they can do. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 You know, uh, this is so complicated. That's the whole problem. Every time you have an earthquake, they say this is a new type, new thing. We have never learned this before. So, uh, how do you predict it? I mean, it is happening so deep below. It can be at any depth. It can be at 10 kilometer. It can be at 10 kilometer. It can go this way. There is the a material huge could vary from material could vary, <laughs> and the rupture. There was a you know there was an experiment done in Parkfield in 2000 in in 1990. Actually, it was in 1988 to 1993. Uh, that was a window they had given for the earthquake. They said so. There were five uh, five ex experiences of earthquakes which had occurred at an interval of 22 years. Five earthquakes. So the USGS, NSF, everybody thought that this is the world's best place to predict earthquake. So they invested so much money there. They had everything possible they had, you know, laser thing, water measurements. Then the earthquake was expected in 1992, December. It was supposed to happen. It did not happen. In 2005, it happened, and the rupture went in the opposite direction. So, but only except that, you know, then there was an AGU, AGU session, one, one AGU meeting had a complete session to explain why this prediction failed. Of course, you know, uh, so there was a lot of discussion on why it could have failed. So, it is not something we understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, basic question. There are planes uh, colliding or Why is, it a, why is it a point phenomenon? It is not a point. It is never a point. Point is only when the earthquake is too small. Like I showed the, the picture of the Andaman, uh, the subduction zone. It is actually a rupture. A portion, I think. Really, no, I think yeah. you mean when we hear these epicenters. See, this uh, epicenter, no, epicenter is only, epicenter is actually given only for a small earthquake. At the point where it originates. But if it is a large earthquake, this is a, this is the source, this green thing, this is the source. It originated, nobody, uh, we will only say that, see that is also why we, we call, we don't anymore call Richter scale magnitude. That is based on point source. You will always read it as moment magnitude. That actually explains the, the, the rupture area, rigidity and the dimensions of this fault will give you the moment. And that moment is converted into magnitude. So you cannot say the epicenter of Sumatra earthquake was here. This is the source, this is the rupture area. It doesn't have a point, so it's a small earthquake. You can say it is a point. Okay, or go search. Let me first check. So, can we push the next session by 10 minutes only? Sure. Or go search me or search me. Bangladesh, not, was he talking about sediment load or? Is it related to big seismic that is starting to be mixed with big seismic? Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, <laughs> what was that? Sea level rise. Sea level rise. That is another another matter. That is another matter. Because if you have glacial melt, or I don't know what he was talking about. The earthquake thing is a you know totally different uh, thing. And I don't. I mean, I. Okay. <laughs> Yes. 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 Can you also fit the temporal earthquake propagation of the rupture? Yes. Yes. Actually, we have done all that. We have done the the propagation of slip. Yeah. I see. The the, the goal here was we have the satellite uh, data. Now we want to match the complete waveform of the satellite, which is actually the tsunami wave itself. Now we want to find out what source parameters would have given rise to that. So yes, time everything. Time. Uh, except that we could not do some parameters were, uh, you know, not correct. Uh, they were 
really you know exaggerated because sometimes what happens you know here the rupture see these are all very interesting problems for us the rupture arrested here and it was here that our biggest mismatch was coming so you know what happens so this is a mechanics problem where a very fast moving train suddenly stops at some particular point so what happens so the model doesn't know that the model is just using that slip so that that was got completely thrown off so we just don't know what is happening there and the physically also the the, the uplift here there was high because we had gps stations there the uplift here was high so we were trying to say okay and what is happening here these are all lot of sediments out here so maybe the rigidity change and it stopped and where the abrupt stop the, the termination occurred everything was different so the models we can't put that in the model we are not using that change in the material so the model also goes and say okay the the, the, the thing is very high and the error estimates also go very high the most important uh, come addition of this model was we we could learn how to propagate the errors and we could do a several iterations and then say okay the solutions are stable and then we can uh, we can believe this thing so this is a part of this is his phd thesis so maybe it's a good point to stop and let's thanks yes. to alindran for a very